Good morning, Open Arms Church. We're delighted that you're here joining us at our Sunday morning broadcast. Thank you for being part of our family. Uh, today is a very a special word for us today. I know we haven't done online in a while, uh, and next week we will be back in person. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, regathering again after just one week of online. But we will be back in person. We have a beautiful baby dedication planned on June 6th. So make sure that you are with us, that you return back with us, because we won't be back online next week. So I hope to see you June 6th live in person. But today I want to just give us a few announcements. We haven't done this in a while. And there where you are, would you give us a thumbs up? Let us know that you're here. You are welcome to also comment. Comment during the sermon. Just comment on today. So, uh, And thirdly, would you share? Would you consider sharing this broadcast on your timeline? Uh, also want to remind you that our VBS is coming up. That's Vacation Bible School for our children. And that is ages 5 through 10 from June 7th through June 11th. And we will be providing a hot meal every day for the children. So if you have a child in that age range, consider being a part of that. Uh, it's going to be just a fabulous time. We have uh, Amber and her friend who are going to be leading this a week for our children. So I hope you can participate in that. This is a perfect time for our giving. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your faithful, consistent obedience to God. And this ministry continues uh, because of your obedience. So thank you for your giving. Again, three ways to give. You can give through our Church Center app. Members, you should know about that. Or our online at openarmschurch.org. Or when we come back in person, you're welcome to give as well. So let me uh, give this final announcement, and that is that our youth uh, camp is coming up. Uh, that is a week over in Lakeland at the Southeastern University. Uh, parents, you should know about it by now. If you have any questions, any concerns, uh, just shoot us a text. Uh, we'll be able to answer that. On June 6th, after service, we will be having a parent meeting so that we can uh, just lay everything out and iron out any of the details. Well, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, and then let's get rolling with today's message from God's heart to us. Lord, we want to say thank you for this day that you have provided for us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity for us to hear and to listen what you have for our hearts. Lord, we pray that your truth today will be transformational. We ask for more than information. We ask for transformation. Father, for this servant, I ask, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So as we are studying today, uh, the message is entitled, Endure Divine Discipline as Divine Love. Doesn't sound like a catchy title. Doesn't sound like one that's going to make you smile or make you laugh or kind of build up your esteem in any way. And that's not the objective. The objective is to look at scripture and learn what the Bible says about God's discipline toward us. We're going to be studying from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. And this is what it says. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Now listen to that. Pause for a moment. It says, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. So part of God's expression of love toward us is discipline. Then it says, who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? Now we know those type of children, right? Yeah, we, you know, they're called spoiled brats. You know, children who are not disciplined properly by their parents, 
become spoiled children. These are the children that you don't want to hang out with when you were in elementary school. These are the children you don't want your own children to hang out with. And the Bible is telling us if there's a child who's not disciplined by a parent, they would be a spoiled child. So it's, it's teaching us here that God the Father, in order for his expression of love to be captured by us, he must discipline us. Next verse. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are an illegitimate, illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Wow. If God doesn't discipline you, this means you are illegitimate. That word illegitimate there in the Bible in Greek refers to a child that is born under slavery. And because that child is born under slavery, that child does not have the rights of a real child. Or that child does not have a promise of the inheritance from the father. So the Bible here is telling us if God doesn't discipline us, then you are a child without the rights of a real son. And you are a child without the promise of the father's inheritance. Next verse. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? We respected our earthly fathers. Some of us did. But we, respect, we respected our earthly fathers because we didn't want the temporary pain of disobedience. Well, it says how much more should we consider the father's discipline and respect him because in his power, he holds the ability to punish or discipline for eternity. So how much more should we respect our heavenly father? Verse 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how. Isn't that true? Parents, you're doing the best that you know how. You know, in my parenting, I discovered how many mistakes I made as I have raised now two who are adult children and one still a teenager, but I've learned how many mistakes I made as a father. How many mistakes have you made? Well, if we make these mistakes and, and, and it's just for now, for, for a few years, as it says here, we discipline us and we did the best that we knew how. God's discipline is perfect. Unlike ours, God's discipline is perfect. It says God's discipline is always, always, always good for us. You know, my discipline wasn't always good for my children. My parents' discipline over me wasn't always good for, my, for myself. But God's discipline is what? Always good for his children. So that we might share in his holiness. Last verse. So discipline is enjoyable. No discipline, excuse me, no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It is painful. Isn't that true? If it's not painful, then it's not discipline. If it's not painful, then God is not getting our attention. You see, God's intention in trying to get our attention is to cause or create a painful environment for us or a painful situation for us. For that will then result in getting our attention. It says no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It is painful. But afterward, everyone say afterward. Afterward. I like the afterward. I don't like the during the discipline. I don't like the during the pain. I don't like the during the test or during the trial. But I like the afterward. I like what the test or trial or the discipline produces in me. Because it says, afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained this way. There's a result. 
Something is produced by discipline, and that is a peaceful harvest of right living by those who are trained this way. Let me leave with you three things. You ready for this? So if you're taking notes, here it is. Endure divine discipline as divine love. Number one, God is treating you as his real child. Remember, the scripture in verse eight told us if he doesn't discipline you, then you are indeed an illegitimate child. So part of the proof of your sonship, part of the proof of you being a child of God is God the Father disciplining you. You know, Jonah was a man that God called to go to Nineveh. And you may remember the story. Instead, he went to Tarshish. He disobeyed God. He did not want to follow God's direction. Then God placed him in a disciplinary action. There was a process of discipline for Jonah. Thrown out of a ship swallowed up by a big fish and in the belly of a big fish for three days and three nights. Discipline. Why? He did not obey. Why? God was trying to get his attention. And guess what? God got his attention. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jonah began to pray. Where? In the belly of the fish. Notice Jonah didn't pray when he was on the ship. Notice Jonah didn't pray when he decided to go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. Notice that Jonah didn't pray when he was thrown out of the ship. It wasn't until he was in a disciplinary action, until he was in a, a place of pain in the belly of a fish. Consider that. Consider the smell. Consider the heat. Consider the disgusting things that you see in that painful place, dark place. Jonah gave God a word of prayer because he was in pain. Sometimes we don't pray until we're in pain. Sometimes pain produces prayer in us. And whenever we go silent and we don't pray to God, God may bring us a, a place of pain in order for us to pray. And that's exactly what happened with Jonah. But let me read you something from Jonah chapter 3, verse 11. Jonah 3, 11 says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I don't know about you. But I am thankful and I am grateful that I serve a living God who is a God who gives second chances. Here in Jonah 3.11, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many of you are thankful that God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and for some of you, a million chances? That's the word of the Lord. It comes to us a second time. Why? Because God is merciful and loving, even in the midst of his discipline. The three things. Number one, God is treating you as his real child. That means you have the rights of a real child. You have the promises of inheritance of a real child. Here's number two. Submit to God's discipline for eternal benefits. That's exactly what verse 9 tells us, that we submit even more to be the discipline of the Father of our spirits and do what? And live forever. You know, my parents uh, disciplined me to a high degree. Uh, their choice of tool was a, was a belt. And I must say I deserved that discipline. And it kind of kept me from a, being a rebellious child. But though I was disciplined by my parents in such a manner that possibly today wouldn't be approved, but though I was disciplined by them because of my rebellion or because of my disobedience, I can tell you today that never, ever, ever did my mother and father kick me out of the house when I was a child and say, go live somewhere else. 
Never ever did they say you cannot eat today. So even in the midst of my parents' imperfect discipline as it may be, they still fed me, they still protected me, they still sheltered me, they still loved me. And if my imperfect parents can still love me, how much more will my perfect heavenly father love me even in the midst of my discipline? Number two, submit to God, submit to his discipline for eternal benefits. And here's number three. It produces positive results. That's what it tells us in verse 11, that discipline has a purpose. Pain has a purpose, and it is to produce positive results. There was a, a child, I read this story of a child who went out to a pond and took his boat and laid it out in the water, but then it got drifted away and, and it became distant from the, the child and the child began to cry because he lost his boat. So a man nearby came and began to throw stones past the boat. The child was confused. The child didn't quite understand what this man was doing. He thought he was trying to sink his boat. But as the man was throwing these stones past the boat, every stone was creating ripples in the water. And as the ripples were being disturbed in the water, it began to cause the boat to come nearer to the son, to the child. It began to come closer to the shore until it finally reached the child and the child understood what the man was doing. Did you know that in our lives, when we drift away from God, when we drift in the water, we get distant from God, there are times that God has to disturb our environment. He would have to cause ripples in our environment in order for us to be drawn back to him. This is why he disciplines us, to get us back and to get us near once again. It produces positive results in us. Endure divine discipline as divine love. Let me read you a scripture from Proverbs. Proverbs, the book of all wisdom, tells us this. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. That's us. When God disciplines us or God places us in a place of pain, we get upset at God. God, how can you let this happen? God, how can you have me here? God, why is this going on? We get upset with God. We complain to God. It tells us, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord, listen, 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 the Lord corrects those he who he loves. The Lord corrects those he loves. God's expression of love toward you and I is discipline. The Lord corrects those he loves. If he didn't correct us, he wouldn't love us. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Wow. This passage is teaching us to endure divine discipline as divine love. Now you may argue with me. And you may say, Pastor, I, I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through because I don't deserve to be punished by God. I've been a good person. I've been doing good things. Well, the first corrective measure in that mindset is none of us are good before God. None of us 
deserve his mercy or that love. So we are all guilty of sin. And we are all in need of his discipline. Now there are times that things happen to us because God is just trying to perfect us. Not because of anything specifically we have done. But then there are other times that God is trying to correct us because of us drifting away from him, becoming distant from him. Wherever you are, if you are in a place that you feel like I'm in the belly of a great fish, I feel like I'm in a season of pain, then I want you to consider the Father loves you. He is expressing his love toward you. He is telling you that he loves you and he is proving that you are his child. He loves you. This is why he corrects you. So what is our responsibility? Submit to his correction. Submit to this season in our lives that we may not have any answers for. We may not quite understand why we're going through this. Submit to God's directions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your discipline. We thank you for your love. We thank you, dear God, that you have chosen to express your love to us, toward us by correcting us, not allowing us to drift away far from you, because far from you means danger, danger to our souls and danger to our lives. But you love us enough to care for us and to cause issues and situations and seasons in order to draw us back to you. Sometimes you are causing pain in our lives so that it will produce a prayer life. Father, whatever you have in your heart, whatever you intend to do with us, I pray you would be faithful as you always are. And continue, Lord. Continue your will upon our lives, even when your will means discipline. And we know that it is not pleasant during the discipline. Pain is not pleasant during the pain, but it will produce positive results. So we look forward to what you are perfecting in us by correcting us. Father, thank you for that expression of love in our lives. And it is in Jesus' name we pray.